Great. I think we will. I think we will get started. Um, my name is Angela Hansen. I'm with the OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, and very happy to have you today as we talk about portfolio exploration and its applications in a couple of different organizations. So I've been with the OECD for about three years. I'm focused on tools, uh, methods, and capabilities for innovation. So this is a very interesting uh, project uh, for me that uh, the team has been working on for uh, about the last year. Just a few notes. Um, we'll have a few opportunities for a question and answer, and please use the Zoom uh, Q&A uh, function to do that. Uh, so that should be a little button at the bottom of your screen, um, and feel free to use that uh, instead of the chat. Um, that would be preferred for us. We're going to be recording the webinar today, and that means it will also be available for you to watch afterwards. And we'll also provide the slides uh, by email as well. I know that's everybody's first question usually, so we will share those. And it's more than just uh, myself that's been working on this portfolio exploration tool. Um, there's a full team at OPSI. Um, and in fact, the whole team uh, has been working on this uh, over the past uh, few months and year. Um, this is kind of the core team you'll hear from uh, most of them on today's webinar. So um, today we'll give you a little bit of introduction to the background of this tool, um, kind of from a theoretical perspective, as well as uh, kind of a technical perspective. We'll even show you a sneak peek uh, of the tool itself. And we'll hear from some panelists. Um, panelists today are uh, in different organizations from uh, both uh, Natural Resources Wales and the city of Lund in Sweden and how they're using portfolio approaches uh, in, in their organizations and how this tool uh, has been used there. They are kind of our, our super users that have started uh, testing it out. So we're gonna hear from their perspectives. And then we'll have a, a panel discussion uh, among uh, ourselves as well as our two uh, guest organizations today. Then we'll follow up with how you can get involved um, and start using this tool and start using portfolio approaches in your organization. And then finally, uh, we'll uh, wrap up and talk about kind of next steps uh, in our development of the tool. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Pirette, who's going to talk a bit about the background and the theoretical development of the portfolio exploration tool. Over to you, Pirette. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is great to be with you and also to talk about uh, why portfolio approaches are so needed uh, to steward innovation within the public sector. So it shouldn't be any surprise that uh, there are actually different types of innovation. So we are working with uh, different uh, types of innovation as well within the OPSI. We're working with the innovation facets model. So Angela can... Uh, show you the model as well. So we are working with uh, different types of innovation. So we are we have an uh, innovation portfolios within the public sector, even if we don't acknowledge them. So even if we don't think about them or don't work with them or steward them, uh, if you're working with innovation, you will have a set of different innovation projects and programs that will encompass the portfolio that your organization, for example, is working with. And at the OECD, uh, we indeed, as I mentioned, we look at different types of innovation. And there are, of course, different categorizations of uh, innovation. So you can look at it from different perspectives, uh, from incremental to blue sky thinking to other types of innovation. Uh, we at the OECD find it uh, important uh, to look at uh, innovation from, uh, from its purpose. So what the innovation is actually intending to do. So that's why we're looking at mission-oriented, enhancement, adaptive, anticipatory innovation. And all of these innovations are connected to different types of questions or purposes that the public sector actually wants to achieve. And for that, uh, these uh, innovations actually answer different questions that are not specific 
to innovation, but uh, the broader goals of the public sector. So we do mission-oriented innovation because we want to achieve the results and goals that we're working on. We do enhancement-oriented innovation because we want to do better at what we are currently doing. So we want to be more effective, efficient, uh, reach more people that we're working with. We do adaptive innovation because there are always uh, new ideas coming from the system itself. So the evolved situation changes what we need to do. And we never know from the top down uh, what those situations or call for innovation actually might be. And also uh, new risks, uh, uncertainties and future developments may actually call in question uh, the type of activities we do in the public sector. So we also have to do anticipatory innovation to look at those fundamental shifts and changes to be prepared in advance. And what is very important that looking at the purpose of public sector innovation, it is to look at how it can be also directed or not directed or what the kind of the level of certainty is connected to innovation, because it really influences how you actually can steward the innovation connected to those different types. So mission oriented innovation is fairly uh, top down. So on a kind of the highest level or uh, on a social agreement, you will agree upon the goals that you want to achieve. So once you have those goals sorted, uh, you can innovate to achieve them. Uh, but uh, in terms of, there is no going back in, in terms of not delivering on the missions that you agreed upon. When we're talking about enhancement, uh, we are talking about high levels of certainty. So we're trying to innovate within our current systems. So existing drivers like austerity or uh, cost reduction or increased demand are great pushers for enhancement oriented innovation. Then the adaptive side that I also mentioned before cannot be steered top down. You cannot say, you know, bring me uh, this type of innovation because we actually won't know the, all the marvelous ways the environment around us is going to shift. So what the new demands may be. So we actually need to spur on creativity and create the open space for innovation for employees to experiment and explore. And last but not least, the anticipatory innovation needs also a different type of uh, support because this is the area of high uncertainty. So some of the ideas that we might look there are maybe also critical to the strategic aims of the organization itself. And thus we work with uh, different types of innovation uh, that also can compose your innovation portfolio. So your innovation portfolio doesn't have to be balanced uh, towards these different types of innovation, but uh, actually, but you need to think about it in a meaningful manner to how to steward these different types of innovation to specific aims of your organization. So you may have a very mission-oriented organization connected to climate change or welfare development, uh, but you also need to do things better, adapt, and also be prepared for uh, new upcoming things. So you need to also think about how to uh, spur on your main topic of innovation within your portfolio, but also allow different types of innovation to happen to not become locked in. So this also has to be a conscious activity. So how can different innovations get along? So how does it work within the portfolio sense? Innovation portfolio management is not by far not a new thing. So actually we need to uh, have a portfolio management that makes sense of the portfolio. So actually know which types of innovations your organization is working on. There has to be also someone who is assigned to steward or making sense of the information and making decisions based on that. Uh, you have to have supportive structures for different types of innovation to coexist. So if you need adaptive innovation, you need to create the space for it, while uh, missions you should lead by great leadership support and from top down. So your portfolio should allow for different purposes to uh, merge, but also connect the synergies between different types of innovation. So an anticipatory innovation can lead to new missions, for example. So how uh, the innovation portfolio management should also question how these different types of innovation are resourced, monitored, evaluated, 
across the portfolio, not by just single organization uh, innovations, but also how your portfolio as a whole is uh, performing. Uh, because single innovations can fail, and this is also uh, their nature, they're risky in, in uh, reality. So if your portfolio succeeds, then that's good enough for the organization itself. And how learning and communication about the portfolio and within the portfolio is actually managed is something that the good innovation portfolio management looks at. And now I give it over to Angela, uh, who is going to tell us about the portfolio exploration tool that we have been developing uh, over the last year, where we're trying to help organizations analyze their organizational context in terms of what type of innovation they support, and also visualize their own innovation portfolio. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Pirette. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how we took this uh, theoretical basis and turned it into a self-service tool. Uh, this is a project that the team has been working on uh, since the beginning of the year. Um, our development process has uh, looks very different than it did at the beginning of the year, uh, much more uh, virtual, but uh, uh, nothing like a virtual uh, development process to build a virtual tool. So it was trial by fire. Um, so a little bit about the tool, um, kind of what's the, what's the value, what's the point? Um, we really wanted to, to build a way that uh, we can do our work in a more distributed way, in a more self-service way. Um, last year and the year before, we were doing a lot of these uh, portfolio exploration workshops, uh, it, physically uh, doing uh, exploration of different organizations' portfolio and then advising on how they might shift the support structures um, to get to where they want to go um, from where they are. And we wanted to develop something that would allow uh, this type of uh, work to be done without us actually having to physically be there. Um, so this is not only helpful, it's serendipitous uh, that uh, we were thinking about this um, kind of pre-pandemic, pre um, but this is also allowing us to continue our work on portfolios and portfolio management um, in kind of the, the coronavirus uh, era. So the different uh, things that the tool does. So it shows you where to develop your innovation capabilities, uh, recommends actions to take based on those results, um, and helps explore kind of what has changed over the past year um, in particular, and where to intervene and make shifts to your innovation portfolio. Um, there's two specific uh, offerings um, that, we're, that we're offering right now. Uh, one is this uh, self-service online tool, which I will uh, show you. And another is a kit um, to kind of help host and run your own portfolio exploration uh, session in your own um, organization. And we'll tell a little bit about that as well. So, one of, the, one of the outputs from the tool is this kind of individualized guidance. So it's a way to understand your organization cap capabilities and show you uh, what your strengths are. So for instance, this is one of the, the results, um, different kind of percentage-based uh, balance uh, based, on, uh, based on your inputs from your organization. We also provide a portfolio management capability score. So as Pirret was telling, talking about kind of the different factors that are important for managing a portfolio, um, we are also kind of exploring what are those factors and how strong are they in your organization. And we provide uh, kind of a score uh, at the end of this tool. And then also there's a way to do a kind of reverse engineering or portfolio uh, project-based mapping. So based on which projects you have going on or which activities that you are supporting, uh, what does that tell us about your overall portfolio? So this is something that we often do, do with uh, individual organizations uh, physically. So we take all of the kind of projects and activities that they're working on in distribution um, because that's what you're getting from your portfolio system. So what can you do with the various uh, support structures in your organization to get a different 
uh, portfolio in the future. So this kind of reverse engineering uh, conversation that uh, we provoke is also uh, mimicked in this digital tool. So you can add kind of your own projects to the map and see where they are placed. The, the kind of high points uh, about the tool are that uh, we are providing individually tailored results and guidance uh, based on your uh, you know, individual scores. And what's interesting for us as well is uh, this is giving us really interesting anonymized uh, aggregate data um, that provides us with a global continuously updated picture of innovation trends. This is also telling us where we should be working, uh, where we should be focusing on um, in terms of the, the work that we do in various um, different areas of innovation. There are different levels of analysis, and I think our guest uh, panelists will talk a little bit about, uh, about this as well. Um, this can be done as an individual. Uh, so you can understand what your individual portfolio is or from your own individual perspective. Uh, it can also be a conversation starter with others in your organization. Uh, this can be done also at the team level. So you can make a case kind of for a deeper look at a portfolio, kind of see how your team fits into uh, an organizational portfolio and decide how you want to act, uh, what role you want to play in your organization or raise a particular issue mm -hmm. as it pertains to, to innovation or the particular innovation that your team is working on vis-a-vis uh, -vis the others uh, in your organization. Uh, this can also be, um, this exploration can also be done by senior uh, central managers or senior advisors to have a kind of snapshot or build a strategy or see if the efforts uh, that are happening in your organization are in line with your ambitions and your strategy. So is it fitting? Is it aligning? So these are the different kind of levels that uh, we've been uh, looking at with the tool. The overall timeline, uh, we've been um, kind of beta testing and we're pre-launching now. Uh, we've had, we have a couple of organizations which you'll hear from next uh, that have really helped us kind of craft and refine uh, this tool based on how it works in practice. And then finally, we will be launching uh, the tool at the Government Aftershock uh, event in November. But I'm going to provide you with a kind of sneak peek uh, of the tool today. So I'm going to show you a couple of different uh, views of the tool. So this is kind of what so there are different uh, questions that you answer according to different uh, kind of elements of your organization, kind of what's your relationship to purpose and strat strategy, risk and permission, um, kind of inclinations and horizons, how do you think about time? Uh, what tools and methods do you use? So there's a number of questions that uh, you respond to, you prioritize different things. Um, so you answer a number of different questions. Then here is a view of some of the results. So in this case, uh, my result uh, was strongly uh, enhancement oriented innovation. So I have the little result on the left and I can learn uh, based on my specific results, uh, what does that innovation might be missing? What are the potential threats and vulnerabilities that I need to watch out for uh, based on my result? And then here is the result from the project-based mapping. Um, so these are different projects that I input onto the map. Um, and it's displaying kind of where my projects have landed. So how many projects do I have in enhancement oriented, mission oriented, uh, anticipatory, and then there are some that are in between uh, these different areas. Uh, and the tool provides guidance on what that means um, and what to do with that, what to do with those projects uh, that kind of land in the middle and what does it mean for the overall portfolio. Um, there's also some guidance on kind of the combined results. So what if your organizational portfolio balance and your support structures 
are not resulting in the project map that you expected. So what does that mean? So this tool provides uh, kind of different guidance uh, tailored to your individual uh, results. Okay. So um, with that, go back to the webinar. Um, I'd like to hear from a couple of different uh, organizations of their um, use of portfolio thinking and portfolio exploration. Um, first, I'd like to actually start with uh, Natural Resources Wales. Um, and, you know, this is important to kind of, we always like to hear from real world uh, practice and cases. Um, we, there's always a way that we expect this tool to work in practice. Um, and we make, of course, a lot of assumptions in getting something off the ground. Um, and it's been very helpful to work with Natural Resources Wales, as well as the city of Lund, uh, to help us kind of refine uh, our assumptions and test them and um, to feed back into the development of the tool. Um, but maybe uh, it'd be very helpful to hear from first uh, Natural Resources Wales, uh, Holly Butterworth and Luke Maggs. Um, how you are using uh, portfolio approaches in your work, and then maybe how you've used the tool specifically uh, to help answer some of those questions. So I'm going to hand it over to, to you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Angela. That was really, really interesting introduction to the tool. So um, can you all hear me okay? Am I coming through all right? Yeah, brilliant. So good yeah. morning, everybody. Absolutely fantastic to be here. And thank you for inviting us to come and tell you a little bit more about who we are, what we do, and how we've used this um, portfolio exploration tool. So my name is Luke Maggs. I work for Natural Resources Wales. I'm by trade um, an operational researcher, which is taking an analytical approach using mathematical modeling to solve what we call in the trade complex, messy, and wicked problems. Now, when we start talking about that, um, we sort of say, well, what does that mean? And, and kind of who are natural resources whales? So I thought I'd just spend a minute or two. I don't have any slides to share with you. I thought I'd spend a minute or two explaining who we are and why we're interested. So why innovation? Why is it important? And then just to go on to a little bit about how we've used the tool and my colleague Holly will kind of go through a little bit more detail of that when we go to the panel section, in the Q&A. So Natural Resources Wales is a fairly young body in the world of public services. We were amalgamated in 2013. Um, Wales is quite unusual in the UK. It's quite unusual in the European Union. I think we're one of the only governments, to my knowledge, that has sustainable development enshrined into our kind of legislation. We have two pieces of very groundbreaking legislation, a new Environment Act and the Future Generations of the Future Wellbeing of Generations Act. Um, and what this does is it places a statutory duty on public bodies to work collectively and collaboratively to consider the needs of future generations and at the same time deliver a new approach to environmental management. And by a new approach, what I mean is trying to embed ecosystem thinking. So this is built on 20, 30, 40 years worth of sustainable development thinking. And it's evolved in recent years. And we've got this kind of statutory approach to better environmental management. NLW itself is one of the Welsh government's largest environmental sponsored bodies, or one of their largest sponsored bodies. We have over 1900 staff across Wales, and we, we have roles from advising Welsh Government on statutory issues. We regulate industry and waste. We um, we designate special sites of scientific interest and conservation areas. We are an emergency responder for things like air quality, marine pollution, fires. We manage and we respond to planning consultations. Um, we educate, we provide grant aid, and we're an evidence gatherer. So we have a hugely wide varying role. And when you say why innovation, why are we even interested in it? The two big challenges facing the environmental sector are the climate emergency and the nature crisis. Both of these things are, the, in my opinion, the two biggest existential crises facing humanity. And we know the solutions to those have not yet been um, embedded across the public sector. So we're really interested in what is the role of innovation in meeting these big challenges, but at the same time, ensuring that our statutory responsibilities around regulation and enforcement are not compromised. And by that, I mean, we have a, a digital network that has to interact with nuclear power stations. So whilst we want to test new and digital innovative tools, we also need 
and to ensure security of our networks. So Holly and myself were tasked with trying to coordinate NLW's informal approach to innovation, and it is very much um, in its inception. We were working closely with a think tank in the UK called the Nesta Foundation, and they collaborated with the university in, in South Wales, where Holly and myself are based. They were speaking really positively about the portfolio approach, and it was on their advice that we started looking and making contact with um, Angela and her team, um, looking at their pet tool, because both... And I have to confess, both Holly and myself are fairly new to the world of innovation. Whilst we both have quite technical day jobs, it is very much um, a new area for NLW. And as such, we were really looking for kind of ready-made frameworks and approaches that would make sense of some of the issues that we've been facing. So um, as Pierre was just talking about, I think every organization does have a portfolio of innovation. It's just that often you're completely unaware that that's what it is. I think many staff speak different language and different terminology. Um, so where I suppose we found it really helpful was it started to crystallize and give a framework for some of the discussions and conversations that we've been having. And, and I think we'll come on to the results a little bit later on when we go through the Q&A. But the sort of early, early observations for us were that they were very much, um, I think some of it told us what we already knew. And I think some of it was really unusual. Um, and I think other elements of the approach helped us go and take these conversations that have been happening in very closed, small groups of like-minded innovators and widen it across the business because in a sense, innovation is everybody's business in order for NRW to do its day job and meet its statutory requirements, deliver this new approach to environmental management. We need to work in a co-productive, collaborative fashion and we need to work with new and emerging technologies. We need to develop approaches to the circular economy and in doing all of that, innovation has a really strong role. But at the moment, we're not really sure as an organization how best to progress this. So I think to sort of sum it up from us, really, um, the main benefit we had was I think it provided a very robust approach and framework for us to even begin the portfolio development. And now that we've started that journey, I'm just really excited to see where it leads us, what new doors and partnerships and opportunities it opens for us. And ultimately, it's about how do we move away from these very crude measures of things like GDP being the, the only measure of social progress and actually move to a more holistic, integrated approach where we start to value the ecosystem services that our natural resources provide as a method for creating a robust, fair, just and equitable society for the communities and people of Wales. So I think I'll finish there. I'm quite happy to take any conversation, any, any questions. Um, but thank you for giving us the opportunity to tell you a little bit more. What I will do is make sure that um, Angela and the others have our email and we're happy to take any questions from the audience at a later date as well. So thank you, Angela. I'll hand back to you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Holly, or uh, did Luke uh, cover all the points? No, I think he did fantastically there. Um, I'll just introduce myself now, though, um, ahead of the panel later. So I'm Holly Butterworth, also from Natural Resources Wales, and my role is Specialist Advisor for Futures Innovation. So my role is to support innovation across the organisation and also to facilitate our internal innovation group. Great. Uh, thank you so much for giving the perspective uh, from Wales. I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Katerina Scott from the city of Lund. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're facing and your approach to innovation and innovation portfolio management? Yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. My name is Katerina and I work for the city of Lund, and actually an uh, innovation platform uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, innovation uh, ministry in Sweden launched a program to try to push down innovation down to city level, because it's it's actually there where you you meet with the hands on on uh, challenges and also have a very hopefully very good collaboration with the new emerging uh, solutions needs. So we are on on a governmental level, we are down to the floor working. Um, in our struggle as, as a city, we are sort of composed of a lot of different departments. We are more or less in charge of, of our own areas, uh, very often not, uh, perhaps for school and healthcare and things like that, but a lot of the areas are also impacted from, 
from the industry, the business side, or, or together with other partners. The special thing about Lund is we are based in the south of Sweden, is that we are we are a university city with a very old university. Loads of, of big innovations like Bluetooth and other stuff are invented in, in the in this city. So we're pretty used to being close to innovation. And the city has become some sort of test bed for very early things. So, but it has always been there, not us really thinking about how it works. And now we are having the biggest research facilities in, in sort of uh, like the European Spallation Source combined with another big sort of research facility being built here. So this innovation area will explode here in Lund and it will impact the city. So for us, it was like, okay, we're going to hand, we, we're going to end up in this super storm of innovation going around all around the city. And here are we in the middle. And, and because it's a small city, we will be very much impacted. So how do we deal with it? So we need to learn. A city uh, authority is not a normal innovation agency. We use, usually sort of take care of, of um, stable delivery of services or goods like streets and healthcare and stuff like that. But still we need to improve. Uh, so our main challenge is actually to create this awareness of how to actually use the potential of innovation within a city, what you need to do how will we talk about this and how will we collaborate with everything that is going on outside of the city? And to do that, we need to have a portfolio thinking uh, of what do we do, what don't we do, what do we do together with others? And are we actually having a portfolio or is everything happened randomly? Uh, so it's, it's a way of trying to structure your thoughts uh, and, and be able to combine the, the inflow from the outside and actually understand how to do it, because otherwise you end up with an endless lot of ideation. And, no, and, and then also being in a political context means that, that you will always get a lot of, we need this, do this, do that, because you, you are in, in this sort of, someone needs to show strength and, and point their hands to something. And we need to think about, can we deliver? And, and what is the context and what is the proper tools and how do this ecosystem of innovation actually works as being like a, a, a city official, you know. It, 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 it's been quite a, a long journey being uh, hand, handling this on, on, on many different levels. So for us, the portfolio thinking was a way to structure all the bits and pieces that we need, and then combine it with other models like uh, multi-stakeholder governance uh, with uh, other kind of innovation theories that you could use, but all, and, and, and to see how does this work together. So we, we, we can work on, on different levels. Like you said, the strategic level with the city council, the city uh, office level, and then down to the departments, down to teams and perhaps persons, because now it doesn't work together it's just scattered so it's a way to, to sort of make it work in your minds to pull it together so for us it's been really helpful to to be able to talk about it in a structured way and thereby building uh, approaches strategies development or or actually saying now this is not what we should do we should focus on this or that and and yeah Fantastic. Um, so now that you've heard a couple of different uh, perspectives from um, from a couple of different organizations and how they're using uh, portfolios and uh, um, uh, portfolio uh, management uh, approaches, um, what I'd like to do is uh, first introduce uh, everyone who's going to kind of be on the panel. So you can ask questions of Pirette about kind of the theoretical uh, background or the tool itself. Um, and if you have specific questions for uh, Katarina or Holly or Luke, um, please add those into the Q&A as well. Um, that's where we'll, we will be uh, drawing questions from. Uh, but to start out with, um, I think I'd like to ask kind of the first question um, to everyone. Um, 
so we've been talking about this concept of portfolio balance. Um, so that isn't necessarily to say to make sure that we have at least five innovation activities happening in each of the uh, areas. Um, but what does portfolio balance mean? Um, and then what does it actually look like uh, in practice? Um, so first, I'd like to ask uh, Pirette that question, um, just to kind of talk about different perspectives that we've seen kind of around the world in our work. And then specifically uh, with Lund and with uh, Wales, what does portfolio balance uh, look like uh, based on your, your work and your uh, approach? Um, Perrette. Thank you very much. I think this is one of the most important questions when talking about portfolio management in its entirety. Uh, because usually when we talk about different types of innovation, the public sector organizations and leaders in public sector organizations also tend to think that, well, if I don't have, you know, a equal number of projects uh, or equal number of uh, funding for all of these different types of innovations, I'm doing something wrong. And that is uh, definitely not the case uh, because organizations have different purposes and aims. So if we're thinking about uh, kind of a, you know, service provider, an organization that is connected to welfare services uh, or working with children and families on the ground, then potentially that uh, kind of caregiving or support uh, service welfare organization is going to do most adaptive innovation because they're going to get, you know, information from their families about what is working and how to adapt their services. So you can have a portfolio that is very adaptive in nature, but may have some core missions that the organization actually wants to achieve, that uh, all the children and families will be actually happy and have uh, you know, good outcomes in terms of long-term uh, development. Uh, so the portfolio looks unbalanced in nature, but it has different types of innovation that the organization is actually thinking about the future or or adapts to changes in practice that is necessary for their field. And then when we're thinking about organizations like NASA, for example, or, or even the European Space Agency, then their kind of portfolio looks very different. It's very anticipatory. It's extremely uh, uh, even mission oriented where we actually get the term. So if your job is to actually think about the next technologies and, and to support the you know, merging technologies within the field, then of course your portfolio is going to be highly unbalanced uh, towards those aims. And yet uh, those organizations also have to tweak their systems and do things better because we are all uh, in charge of public money. So they are also developing efficiency goals and they will have adaptive changes that they need to do. Uh, but their portfolios are going to look very different. And that's why it's so important to connect your strategic aims within the organization to the innovation portfolio as well in the analysis when you, when you do it in practice. And think about what your organization is actually called to do and how to avoid lock-ins. So even if you have a slightly unbalanced uh, portfolio because your strategic aims are certain things, then how can I support different types of innovation that we actually get the information that maybe I should do something differently. Great. So let's hear from, from Wales. What does portfolio balance look like uh, in your organization uh, in practice? I know we've had a couple of conversations about the different areas within your organization and the different roles that they play. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about what that looks like uh, specifically for you. Yeah, sure, sure. So firstly, I'd say that it doesn't necessarily need to be equal across all of the facets, but we do need to have capability in each of those areas. Something that we noticed with the outputs from our tool that when we trialed it was that we're very strong in the enhancement space. And I think that's quite natural. Um, we are obviously a public sector organization and within our organization, we have some really highly specialized skilled um, staff working in different areas, which I think lends itself to that enhancement space. Um, but we do need to be a little bit stronger, I think, in the anticipatory space, which um, I think Luke was touching on earlier with those massive challenges that we're facing with things like um, the climate change emergency and the nature collapse. Those are things that we really need to have quite um, radical solutions for that probably sit in that space. So we know that we need to do more in that area. 
Um, but as I said, it's I think it's mostly about capacity. We need to be able to innovate in those spaces. Um, in terms of exact spread, I wouldn't like to say and represent the whole of NRW on this because we're just doing a pilot um, at the moment. So I think that that kind of conversation requires a lot more people in the organisation. Yeah. That was really interesting, Holly. I think the only thing I'd add to that, um, so apologies everybody earlier, I didn't have my video on, so um, there was just had a few connection issues. Um, so the only, like as Holly sort of touched on then, I think one of the observations that we've had from using the tool is given the spread of remits that we manage in Natural Resources Wales, um, there's almost an argument for using this within divisions and within departments and looking at the balance within departments, because as Holly's already said, just because it's balanced, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. And in some sense, and this is my personal observation as opposed to the official kind of viewpoint, but having something that is clustering where there's equality in each of the kind of quadrants is almost slightly worrying in a sense because one of the things we do know is that in order to meet these massive challenges as Holly's already alluded to I think we are going to need to move more into that kind of anticipatory or dealing with uncertainty we have some strange terms that we use to talk about the future of environmental science and this kind of moving beyond the normal way of doing things and I think that's our biggest challenge is how do we move some of our public resources and we are a public body we are funded with taxpayers money and we need to experiment more and we need to move into this kind of more anticipatory innovation space but that's very difficult when we're having to balance all of the needs as a statutory regulator as an enforcer um, needing to be risk averse in many bits of our business we can be very risk averse and at the same time we know we need to take risks in order to meet these big challenges so i think um, i think catherine summed it up really nicely in her talk actually giving a structured methodological way for having conversations has been the biggest benefit for us great thank you um katarina would you like to add your perspective from Mun about uh, portfolio balance or to respond to anything that's been said um, just now. Yeah, no, I think the conversation is actually the, been the best thing because sort of doing this kind of, uh, we, we, we talk about this sort of, uh, there is no truth in, in your, your sort of uh, mapping because you change all the time and, and balance or not balance depends on where you are. So, so it's been a way of, uh, for us, it's been a way of, of actually being able to have the conversations. And what, what I, but what I did find actually, what, which was very interesting is that the two uh, enhancement and anticipatory areas are those that are not considered innovations within, within our organization. So that means that there were actually no, uh, no given structure or specific goals or perhaps resources given to those areas because they are just supposed to happen. And most of the work within a city is actually in these two areas. The mission oriented is like, oh, climate neutral Lund in 2030. That's a political goal, it gets a lot of attention, uh, but still you just say it and you don't give, give it sort of the place it has, but it, it has, uh, it's much more uh, visual uh, the, the work we do that is more uh, sort of uh, anticipatory is, is also because we, we are exploring things with risk uh, and, and been claiming this area. It took us seven years to actually claim the area to say, we are the ones who take all the blame if you fail. So give it to us and everyone was really happy. So it becomes with sort of the possibility to, to visualize the different areas and the different needs. And when you have that discussion, you can see how it fits together. So if we find something, so we can say we take the risk, we're expert in this, we, we don't get anxious, I sleep well overnight and, and you can give me your problems and I take the blame if you, if you have it. And then it becomes easier for perhaps the healthcare sectors. We can do something so we can, we can actually become partners and we hand over our things when you need to, to sort of upscale it. And the interesting thing is for us, because we were in the glitch between the city and, and like we have like 50 external partners, organizations, NGOs, clusters, diversity, is that we are free to hand over for upscaling anything. So by having these kind of thinking structures and the conversations, it's like you, you hand over things. You should grow this one. This suits in your portfolio. What are you doing? 
so I, I think uh, the 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 both very uh, possibility to have a portfolio and then talk is this a balance? Should it be balanced? Where should it be? Should healthcare have more of this and we should have more of that? Just talking about it creates something new. Uh, and, and, and I think that's the biggest benefit. So I would go from balance, uh, depending on your, how you, you enter the area. What are the questions you bring with you? And, and for certain, if you want to do a, a, a mission thing, you need to see that all the others are in place or you have a mission, like a, a vigilante mission because there is no next step to, to, to actually be connected or catch what is coming out of it. So, so it's, it's sort of, hmm, I like the thing that everyone is needed and everyone has a place and everything is, is just an important, but it has different flavors. Very interesting point. And it's, it's very encouraging to hear that uh, by using the tool, it, it forced these kind of conversations to happen that maybe were long overdue. Uh, so that's one of the main uh, benefits of, uh, well, first, our, our kind of physical workshops where we would have these conversations about portfolio balance um, and portfolios of projects, um, but also now in the, the digital tool um, is that it's really helpful in kind of bringing up those conversations. Um, that's, that's one of the primary benefits uh, in our minds. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's, that's actually uh, working. And can I can add something. And, yes. and one of the other really good things about the tool is that because this is quite a, it's very hard to capture. Sort of, we are doing innovation. Or so what is that? And we, so I'm from the academia city, so we can debate the word academia, and innovation, or what is what endlessly but suddenly when you do the benchmarking you sort of you get a picture which is like you 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 put you put the nail down you hammer it down and you get a starting point for your discussion because usually why we don't get an equality or strategies or even hands-on work coming out from our our developments or enhancements or whatever is because we don't have a clear starting point for our dis discussions or our partnerships or our areas or our task commissions because first you have to agree where to start and then you can develop so if you we can't agree about the starting point anywhere this just goes on like this and it ends up like a policy document where everyone is recommending everyone everything and nothing is happening and, and then you get bored and you leave the organization and you try to do something somewhere else, which is the normal thing within a city. So that is one of the most appreciated things that, that the possibility to create a starting point, like nail it down. Excellent. So I'm gonna take a, a question from uh, participants uh, and that's, and Katerina, you hit on it a little bit, uh, but maybe um, Pirette and uh, those in uh, Wales would like to, to hit upon it a little bit more is um, how can the tool help in finding synergies between different uh, innovation projects? Um, so that was uh, one of the questions that came up in the Q&A. Um, Pirette, do you wanna kind of talk about uh, from the kind of tool design perspective of how that's uh, being addressed. And then we'll ask um, Wales the same. Mm -hmm. Again, a very insightful question uh, overall. And I think from the tool perspective, like the first baseline that Katarina was also hinting at is that what we've seen from the international practice and our partnerships within uh, different countries in public sector organizations is, unfortunately, these discussions are just not happening. That uh, the public sectors uh, in OECD countries have become extremely project oriented or project based, uh, but uh, there are not a lot of occasions where actually uh, these project portfolios or different innovation projects are actually steward or looked at uh, together. So we can have uh, so many different projects connected to climate change, but do we actually reach the goals that we want to achieve? So if, if it's connected to the kind of mission oriented part of the portfolio itself. So there is this kind of huge gap that we are trying to address. So the tool itself at the moment 
within its different uh, modules, what it's trying to do is that um, we also are looking at it from a kind of system and organizational perspective, that it's not only about the projects, but it's also about how your organization thinks and what it supports. So the first part actually uh, doesn't uh, you know, address the kind of the project portfolio, it actually addresses your own organization. So what types of activities or innovations does your organization as a whole support? Because it has an operating, uh, a way of operating. So the way you do procurement or the way you do um, human resource planning, and this also gives input into the kind of the types of innovations that you're more comfortable in, in working with or how you put together different teams, for example, that has a way to influence innovation. So that, that's the kind of the first layer. Um, but the second layer indeed is actually looking at the innovation portfolio. So asking different purpose oriented or how these innovation projects are created or supported to see uh, like, the, do they have actually intent? So do they, are they mission oriented in nature or are they anticipatory in nature? And then to land them in, in different zones to look at them together. And then well, if you have, for example, uh, kind of a portfolio connected to climate change or others, uh, then it is a, a, able to look at those projects uh, indeed together and to see are there synergies or discords between the attempts of these projects. Like, are they, uh, what role are those projects uh, playing in terms of adaptive change or anticipatory change or, or missions? So how do they actually fit together? So this becomes extremely important, especially in the kind of the mission space as well. So if you're running towards a goal, uh, do the projects or discrete or separate projects actually support the goal that uh, we want to achieve? But on the other hand, you can also ask, uh, um, is there something within our innovation portfolio that is questioning the type of innovation that we want to come out of that? Because sometimes also the ways that we have worked before aren't actually delivering on that goal. So we are keep on doing the same kind of things, but we're not achieving it. So we need to have a little bit of outside of the box thinking. So we find it uh, in different uh, kind of uh, analog and digital experiments that we have done with the tool that having the visualization and uh, guide, guiding questions actually helps with the uh, conversation to see the synergies between. And sometimes they are not only synergies, but as I hinted as well, that there's a discord. And this might be also discord by design. That uh, you might have anticipatory innovation projects that are there to actually question your mission. Because if you're, for example, developing your healthcare system, but there is a hypothesis that uh, most of the jobs of doctors, for example, are going to be automized. They're going to have a healthcare system without doctors. So it's a very kind of uh, um, fantastic or fairy tale example, but there are also countries who are working with these types of hypotheses. So there should be a allowance uh, within your kind of innovation portfolio to actually uh, raise those kind of critical uh, questions and, and prepare for it. So both the synergies and uh, also the kind of discords in between and how do you support them? So hopefully the tool actually helps to facilitate those conversations within your organizations and helps you to look at it uh, from a stewardship perspective together as well, that if this is the situation at the moment, Am I actually happy with it? And we haven't yet encountered an organization that has been fully happy when we've done the test. So there's always kind of a desire for change. Yeah, that's a really good point, Perrette. And you're reminding me uh, of a few conversations actually where we were talking uh, with uh, some organizations who mentioned that they were leveraging uh, the political uh, legitimacy of some mission-oriented projects in order to create uh, space for uh, for others. So um, ones that are more uh, questioning the status quo. Um, and this allowed them to kind of have that conversation of, oh, well, this project is actually uh, made possible by this uh, mission uh, that's important to our leadership, but we're using it as a way to build capacity for you know, a new type of uh, approach or implementing a new tool. So that's also kind of a something that gets brought to light uh, within, the, um, within the portfolio as well. Um, 
another perspective from, from Wales on synergies and uh, finding those synergies between innovation projects. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, oh, go on, Holly, you go first. Oh, no, you jump in. Um, so, yeah, just building what Perrette said, I think she said, covered a lot of it very eloquently there, actually. But um, just going a step back before the synergies, I think the tool really helps to get an understanding of where innovation is happening and where the projects actually are in the first place. There's a kind of sense-making element to it. Um, and then later, kind of opening the conversation between those projects so that you can see where the synergies are prompted by those questions. Um, and another thought I had was also around looking, looking at different projects through different lenses on the different facets. So say you identify that um, quite a few projects sitting in your enhancement facet. Could you take some of those projects and look at them um, through like an anticipatory lens and maybe use that in a kind of like a project uh, problem solving way to enhance what you're doing sorry Luke, you, you carry on no no that was good yeah I was just gonna um I think similar to Perrette's viewpoint a little bit I suppose for me it's sort of inverting that question that says okay so how does it help you find synergies with innovation projects in, in a sense one of the more useful elements for us was seeing the opposite and looking at all where are things going wrong um to sort of put that in perspective we ran an innovation fund we started off um uh, really creating a a loose fund that could be used for experimentation and testing of new ideas and it all started off with the best of intentions and then we quickly ended up in the the usual public service approach where we had to ensure transparency of funding, um, clarity of decision making. And we ended up in, in effect running a small internal grant scheme. Um, and one of the things that sort of, I think the tool helped with quite a lot was to highlight where we had a, a variety of projects submitted to the fund. Quite a lot of them went through. And interestingly, the ones that seemed to fail to progress through the system were arguably the ones that had a stronger core of innovation. Um, so one of the things that really kind of jumped out at me on this was um, the whole concept of actually selling the idea. Like it's not a nice thing to have. It's a core competency for being an innovator and ideas matter, experimentation matters, but actually for us being able to sell the idea and the importance is even more important. So I think uh, Perrette touched on issues around procurement and for us particularly, we, we had issues around how we get applications and software through our internal IC, IT processes. So I think one of the, the real benefits of the tool was start to show how the organization thinks about innovation and then also the portfolio approach of managing the projects. And I think because we're very much at the start of our journey and probably not as experienced as others on the call in this, um, in a sense, module one, I think for us was very helpful. I think it started to articulate some of the discussions and the barriers that we've been coming up against. So that was all I really wanted to add to that section. Okay, let's uh, let's shift to talking about a portfolio management capability. Um, this is a conversation that looks very different in uh, different governments, uh, largely based on what is the structure uh, of that government. Uh, are we talking about a highly decentralized uh, form where you know stewardship and and uh, overall uh, portfolio management looks very different uh, versus a very uh, centralized structure and kind of what does it look like to have one group or entity uh, looking at all of the innovation projects and activities as a whole? Um, does that exist? Uh, what does it look like or what could it look like um, in, in different organizations? Um, and Perrette, you touched on a little bit uh, earlier about what were the kind of components of it, uh, but based on what you've seen so far with uh, different uh, organizations in practice, uh, what does this actually look like? Um, what is a portfolio management uh, capability and, and who's doing it? I think it's easier to answer who is not doing it, <laughs> but uh, in the public sector sense, uh, uh, as was also mentioned by Luke and Holly, that uh, you can actually do portfolio management on different levels. And I think it really needs to, we need a little bit to think about where does it make the most sense? Because it can also make on a city level. So you look at it a full city or a full ministry, because we want to actually see where our organization is strategically working. Uh, but uh, we, uh, for example, an innovation team or innovation lab, uh, can also think about uh, their own portfolio in terms of 
what are the activities we are doing and what are the aims connected to that? So are we in the right business uh, in terms of the projects that we are running? So you can also say that the portfolio management capabilities uh, really much are connected to this uh, intent or, or looking at also your organization about where does it make the most strategically the most sense? So where are my uh, goals uh, coming from? Um, because it's also very good to think about uh, you know, these things through from a team's perspective, but uh, maybe your team is also part, a larger, a part of a larger organization. And what we see specifically within public sector organizations and these cross-cutting issues and goals uh, that uh, usually go beyond one team, so climate change or these very wicked issues that also require us to work beyond uh, the public sector itself is that we also need to think about our portfolio a little bit differently. Uh, not only about uh, what my unit, for example, is doing, but like how my unit's portfolio is interacting with this other unit's portfolio that we should actually be delivering or thinking about those goals, or how do we fit together? So that it can be different levels uh, of thinking about on a team's level, but also or organizational level, or even on a kind of a mission or a, or a goal level that you think about the innovation portfolio. Um, but I think that the main question is uh, who is actually like the portfolio management actually starts with the question, who is actually doing it? Is someone actually responsible or dedicating time and space to do the portfolio management? So who is collecting this information and who is making sense of it? Who is periodically looking at it in terms of are we going in the right way? Are we are we um, kind of doing it uh, the right way as well? So, I mean, it doesn't, uh, it's helpful for a once one time kind of sense making, but if you're thinking about through portfolio management, this has to be an ongoing activity. So somebody has to really think about it. I mean, innovation change, our activities will change. So there has to be someone responsible for to do it as well. Uh, this doesn't have to be in different systems or different organizations. It doesn't have to be the top management uh, always leading on these issues. Um, but uh, it should be, you know, it might be connected to your business management or business development uh, goals. Or, for example, if we are very concentrating on a specific issue or working on that issue, then the kind of natural leaders within that uh, mission or issue uh, would also take the responsibility of doing the portfolio analysis or the team or the kind of the in charge of that anticipatory agenda or the transformative agenda would take that uh, charge of that analysis themselves. Um, but uh, the kind of the time and space to actually do the sense-making activities is, is the kind of the key starting point uh, in any organization because otherwise it will kind of uh, fall under the radar and doesn't get done. And then, of course, uh, you will have uh, other challenges connected to portfolio management as well as, as to how do I evaluate uh, my portfolio? So how do I actually know that I am, when I'm making sense of those uh, activities or my organization, that I'm doing the right things? So how do I, how do I know that? Uh, and uh, here as well, uh, it is important to not only look at the kind of the singular points of the innovations themselves, but to also have the capability to evaluate the performance overall with on a kind of portfolio perspective. Because innovations will and can and will fail. Um, you know, if, you're, if you have 100% success rate in innovations across your portfolio, you're probably in the wrong business. So uh, you're, not, you're not actually taking any risks. You're probably not doing any innovation work either. Uh, but uh, as long as you are kind of the work that you're doing across your portfolio is taking you towards those strategic goals or helping you avoid, you know, effects or futures that you don't want to actually achieve, which is also one of the goals of anticipatory innovation, then you are doing a good job. And the ability to demonstrate that uh, to uh, outside is also something that is needed for kind of effective portfolio management uh, themselves. And then I think the kind of the partnerships and communicating across the teams as well that, you know, uh, do we always need to have everybody uh, kind of being aware about the big picture of the portfolio as well, uh, then probably not like every, not everybody within the organization will be able to work that way. But at least what the input of these different teams or projects to these broader aims of the organization are, 
and should be also clear because we also, I mean, in the public sector, our goals cross, uh, you know, cities we're working with outside partners as well and always the question is do we have to have consensus or the same kind of portfolio to work on these issues with our private sector partners but i think that uh, from the public sector perspective your ability to actually analyze uh, the kind of the meeting point of a private partner or a network partner or ngo partners portfolio with your portfolio like where do we match and where do we, you know, can motivate and incentivize to go to the right direction and the rest we don't actually have to cover because different organizations have different aims. So the ability to do this analysis and also analyze the motivations of different actors and partners within your portfolio is also one of the kind of crucial skills from looking from our side. But again, first comes the space and time to actually do that work and then you can work on the ability to do so. Great. Um, maybe we'll go with uh, Lund first about creating that time and space and what does that look like in Lund? And then also uh, maybe related to that, though this is a question from uh, specifically for Lund about uh, uh, how do you coordinate? Someone's wanting to know how do you pull it all together? Um, so maybe that's a bit of a portfolio management question as well uh, that you can address at the same time. But what does portfolio management uh, look like for you? How do you do it? How do you create that space? Who's doing it? Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, portfolio management has a huge risk in it. it because as soon as you add management to anything and, and as being a city, you end up being like transparency, authority, legislations and rules, which are basically loads of the things that we normally do. So everything ends up like I heard about the fund. So everything ends up like in a structure where you have to, to fill in certain boxes and then everything around innovation actually disappears because the innovation by its nature is not done that way. You can't follow an A to B to C process all the time. So it's a lot of entrepreneurship built into innovation in actually delivering something, your insights or, or process. So, so you, this is, is the, the key thing you ask, how do we make it work? You have to be able to connect uh, like people relation with project management. So the key thing is, is this is not a process management system. It's, it's more like a people relational orientated system when you have to do it. So what you do when you add it, you add this systematic approach where you need to find what are we doing, why are we doing goals and everything around it. And then you need to add the layer of the people because you need to find your champions who will go and do this anyway and they will stay put and they will get sort of hammered on because it's it's sort of you have to sort of stay there so in our case it's been to try to combine these two ways by, by systematizing uh, all these sort of why how what, what do we do and and measurements and and all the sort of the, the framing and then you have to add the the meeting of people, relations, supporting. So we are basically talking about to, to manage this, you need a facilitator of projects and people. And the facilitator will have to be some kind of neutral person or entity that is sort of, it's, it's more of a negotiational area where you negotiate sort of uh, the, 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 the different areas needs or uh, anticipatory to, 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 for example, enhancement. What, what, how do we transform something here? There is a, 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 the gap in between is, is a negotiation where you are, are trying to say, okay, well, you need this and you need that. How can we, and then you have to go there until, until, until you make it fit. Any, any, any kind of thing. And that's the same side with the external, with business. Well, I'm the city, this is what I need and you need this. And then you need to be able to stay in this uh, sort of unclaimed space and negotiate and work with this until it locks, and until it fits. And if it doesn't, you have to park it. 
And you, you, the, the main thing is you need to see that you don't get upset, you don't cause political crisis or, or make usually people pissed off, just saying, because then when that happens, you can, it doesn't matter what you say and what's written, it doesn't happen. So it's, it's, it's a very tricky way to, to actually relay things in, in a portfolio of, of innovations, because it's, it's both technical and then so much personal. Um, that's just for my learning. So, so that is what actually, and also allow to take time. Our, our best uh, portfolio management has been taking of these three years. Uh, moving things from really sort of uh, like uh, almost weird things within mobility to today ending up with one of the first uh, electric charging from below uh, sort of heavy traffic uh, innovation tested out in Lund with like three or four departments involved and the region and this sort of national level. It took us three years. So, so it, it is someone is, is like constantly just from knitting things together in small steps. So it's, it's not, you have to have endlessly sort of, you have to be able to wait and then go, oh yeah. And then you beg a bit and then you, you deliver the goods and then you call in the experts. And it's, it's like ongoing, like you need to like that. And then it happens and then you, She'll never ever forget to tell the great story of all your successes. So if I would give any advice to anyone trying to do anything within this area is go strength based. Talk about what's good, talk about what's happening. Give everyone and all projects something good and stop being obsessed with problems because no one wants to be a problem and no one wants to be associated with a problem so you always need to find the an, an, an upside of everything so it's also an approach that you need so that's why I'm saying it's difficult with the city because you are main, mainly like the the rule maker and then you have to have the other side so it's, it's, it's a but it's, it, it's possible right so I hope uh, we can all learn a bit from your prior uh, cuts and bruises um, in that regard. Uh, Wales, do you have any anything to, to add to that from the kind of portfolio management capability side? You have this, of course, this fund that you mentioned, um, yeah. and that's a, a bit of a, a, a way to manage the portfolio. Um, is that uh, been helpful or is there other ways that you also think about portfolio management? So there's probably a couple of other ways. I'm sure Holly will come in in, in a moment. But one of the things um, for us, there's two points I wanted to make quickly. One was that the Natural Resource Wales, the formation of our organization in itself was actually quite an innovative and it was quite a radical thing that Welsh government decided to do. So our whole organization, you could argue, is possibly in the innovation space completely because we were formed because of that. But just to echo that kind of time issue, it's taken us seven years since the formation of the organization to be in the position we're in today. And, and the position we're in today is we sit, I sit within a multidisciplinary team, very much transdisciplinary in our analytical, statistical, economic support. We've been very fortunate and it's taken a long battle to secure the resources of people like Holly. So Holly is our futures and innovation specialist. She sits in a team next to an evaluation specialist, next to somebody who specializes in risk and uncertainty. We have a, a dedicated evidence synthesis and communication expert. So we sit in this very technical, small interdisciplinary team. Sounds amazing. Sounds like we're dripping with resources and that is not the case. So our biggest problem then is saying, well, how do we scale this support? So Holly and myself are tasked with providing that central coordination point, that bit of capability. Um, but one of the ways I like to talk about this is the three C's. So we look at the culture of the organization to do innovation and its appetite for risk and uncertainty. We look at, yes, the capability, what staff resources do we have? And it's fine to have the capability. It's another thing to free up the capacity. And whilst Holly and myself have responsibility for this area of work, I also deal a lot with complex modeling. Holly deals a lot with supporting people around futures and horizon scanning. So it's just that once you have the resources, you then need to protect that specialism because it's very easy to spread it too thinly. Um, so I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Holly, in the kind of side of things. But... 
Yeah, yeah, I think um, Luke, you're touching on there some of our big challenges. Um, and one of those is just around getting a good understanding from across the whole organisation where we have so many different departments and specialisms to have a good picture all the time of where innovation is happening and to keep that up to date is definitely a real challenge. Um, I was just thinking on some of the things that um, were being said by City of London there around um, where does it make most sense? And I think that's something we need to consider is we need to maybe prioritise which areas we want to focus on first for um, portfolio management. Um, there were some other thoughts as well. I had actually more of a question around, I think one of our other barriers is getting everybody on the same page with what innovation actually means, going back to basics and how do we ident how do we define what would go into the portfolio? So I can imagine that some of the first questions that would come back to us once we start speaking to staff about the things that they work on is they'll say, what is what is innovation? Is this thing I'm doing innovative? Should that be included in the portfolio? And I think that's a really important question and something that we haven't really fully defined yet. So I'd be really interested in what the other panelists thought on that. Any uh, quick reactions from other panelists? And then we'll hand it over to our colleague, uh, Alex. But quick reactions? Well, I think it's a very good question as well. So this is one of the things that the tool doesn't do. It doesn't tell you to, you know, this is not an innovation, you should kick it out of, of your portfolio. So this is an extra step that you have to actually do it to yourself. So um, I think this is something, uh, you know, we should actually give guidance on, on also not concentrating on the long, like the low hanging fruit in terms of like innovationness or how to actually uh, think about the innovation projects. So we have also partnered with other uh, participants or other cities within Sweden and other organizations that have also developed guides to say, well, for example, this is an anticipatory innovation or this is not, or, you know, innovation projects within our organization have to follow these kind of broader criteria. But I think it should be a flexible uh, kind of discussion, you know, broader goals connected to that. So when we are talking about it, we usually have a definition that it should be novel to the context. So it doesn't have to be new, new uh, to the world as such. It has to be implemented. So you shouldn't only be talking about the prototypes. And it also has to have impact in terms of shifts in public value or, or, or change. But otherwise, we're not going to just talk about the simple change. But of course, we the portfolio tool, what it helps to classify is that is this innovation actually driven by a mission or was it driven by, but how innovative it is by nature is something that you have to kind of clarify yourself when using the tool. Great. So I think that's, uh, oh, um, I think that's probably all the time we have for the, pan, uh, the panel discussion now that it's just getting uh, juicy, unfortunately. Um, I want to make sure that I uh, hand it over to my colleague, uh, Alex, that can tell uh, others how to get their hands on the on this tool. Um, and of course, we're all framing it as if you do this uh, tool and it's going to solve all your innovation problems. Um, but I think what we've seen today is that uh, to really make it, it is only a tool um, and it takes really dedicated uh, organizations like Natural Resources Wales and the city of Lund to really be wanting the to have these discussions uh, to to look deeper into what exists and to have a team around them that's willing to go into this uh, journey with them. So I would also just say that it is a uh, just a tool um, and uh, it's not going to solve all your problems, but maybe it will uh, force some questions um, that are long overdue. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, um, Alex, uh, to talk a little bit more about how uh, people would get their hands on the tool uh, and a little bit about what's coming up. Over to you, Alex. Thanks, Angela. So, <clears throat> We've been working uh, this year towards something called Government Aftershock, which is a, an opportunity, an event program to bring together different, uh, different conversations all around the world about what does this big crisis mean. Um, when you have a big shock, it's really important to take stock because uh, it's changed our world, so it should change uh, what we think and do about it in that world. 
Uh, there's a risk, you know, that if we just continue on, focus on being busy and, and responding to issue after issue, that we're going to miss the changes that we really need, the more, the deeper, more systemic shifts that might be needed and that this window of opportunity, hard one as it is, grants us. So government aftershock will be uh, a series of events on 17th of November, ho hosted by lots of different groups all around the world, followed by a high level uh, forum on the 18th, where we'll be talking with leaders and practitioners about, well, how do we take these hard one lessons and really integrate them into the work of government? Uh, one of the things uh, where this intersects is the, your opportunity to um, take part in this uh, by using the tool which we'll be releasing uh, to those who sign up on the event site um, in advance and then having a chance on the 17th to talk with Perrette and Angela to share your experiences with the tool and feedback some input. Now, what we're really trying to get at with the, the core things of government aftershock are these three questions. What do we need to leave behind? What do we want to keep? And what should we do differently? And we hope that the, the, uh, the portfolio exploration tool will be a useful contribution to that because it gives you a chance to take stock. It gives you a chance, as Katerina was talking about, to put a, a nail in the ground to say, well, this is where we're at. And to have that conversation around, well, is where we're at where we need to be, especially in these changed contexts. Um, so we hope that this tool will provide you the opportunity to uh, have those conversations, think about, well, what are we doing? What, are the, what is the natural tendency of our organization? And is that really suited to where we find ourselves today? And everyone who's uh, signed up for this um, will be sent the, the link with where you can sign up to do this exercise in the week preceding Government Aftershock and details about the event on the 17th as well. Thanks. Great, so this is, uh, thanks Alex. Um, so if you'd like to run your own kind of self-organized strategy session and host uh, one of these events in the week leading up to the Government Aftershock event, uh, the registration link is on this uh, page uh, it's oe.cd slash pet host, P-E-T dash host. Uh, so again, uh, we'll, uh, your role as a host is to invite uh, either a small group uh, to have this conversation or your entire organization, uh, whether that be uh, you know, your, in your uh, department or an entire ministry, uh, really the size is, is up to you. Uh, if it's your first conversation, we recommend starting with a, a kind of smaller group, uh, about uh, 10 to 15 uh, people. Um, maybe it's a work team or a group of, of teams uh, together. Uh, but where do you want to start this conversation? This is up to you to, to define. Uh, so we'll send you a, uh, a kit that includes a kind of facilitation plan and communication plan of how to run your event. Uh, we should plan for a two hour uh, session um, and then 30 to 45 minutes uh, for the kind of self-assessment in advance. So you're going to be asking those on your team to, uh, to do the tool themselves and then compile the results together and have a conversation about it, uh, answering those three questions that Alex uh, mentioned. Uh, that uh, two hour session should happen sometime uh, between the 9th and the 16th of November. And then on the 17th uh, and, and during the, the event itself, uh, we will be talking about uh, the, the kind of aggregate results that we see from across uh, different organizations and bringing in those insights and perspectives from the conversations that you've been having. So again, if you need that link, uh, it's at the screen here. This will also be available in the slides uh, we send after. So this will include access to the tool, a facilitation guide, and kind of tips and tricks for how to run uh, your own hosted session. And this is available to do either physically or uh, virtually, we understand, or hybrid actually. Uh, we understand there's a, uh, a lot of different configurations these days, so we're trying to keep that flexibility uh, in mind with the kit itself. Um, so that's 
that we have uh, to, to share with you today. We really hope to, um, to uh, see you at the Government Aftershock event. We hope you'll sign up to host your own uh, event as well. And I really want to thank uh, our, our guests today um, from Wales uh, and from the city of Lund to kind of give us a real world perspective on what does this look like uh, in practice. Um, these have been our super users uh, for the, the tools from early questions to our initial kind of alpha uh, version of the tool. Uh, they've been helping us think through uh, what are the questions that this tool should help provoke, um, which has then informed uh, the design and further development uh, of the tool. Uh, so I want to thank them, uh, as well as all the others uh, who are uh, not on uh, this webinar today, who have also kind of contributed their insights uh, as well. Um, and thank you today for kind of digging into these questions of portfolio balance and portfolio management capability and all these uh, tricky questions that uh, are, of course, not only about the mechanics of innovation, but also the relational uh, and interpersonal and political uh, dimensions uh, within organizations. So thanks for getting into the, the messy bits of that uh, with us and giving us some, um, some different perspectives uh, from your organization. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Thanks so much to participants for joining us uh, as well, and uh, hope to see you at the next uh, webinar. Have a great day, everyone.